Um, and we're here to talk about the future of bike technology. And it's gone in leaps and bounds over the past few years. It's seen extraordinary growth, hasn't it? And the very limits of what we thought was possible has been pushed as well, from disc brakes to aerodynamics. And of course, to the growing parts of the market as well, e-bikes and gravel, uh, which of course is an exploding market. We're here to ask though, what does the future hold? What are the trends saying? And also ask some more of the difficult questions. How can the bike industry be more sustainable as well? So to reflect on what their brands are doing, how they've evolved and how they'll continue to evolve looking ahead to the future as well. Please welcome up onto stage with me for Ribble, a former pro and under 23 world champion turned head of product, Jamie Burrows. Three T CEO Rene Vitz. BMC Head of Research and Development Stefan Christ. And Bianca Marketing Manager Claudio Maznata. Well, hello, chaps. Welcome along. Are you all enjoying your evening so far? Oh, very good, thank you. Very good. Ready? Fantastic place. Fantastic. Great. Stefan? Absolutely. Like good. the venue. Yeah. Claudio? Absolutely amazing. Thank you. There you amazing. There we go. Very, very happy panel indeed. Um, okay, and tell me now, each of the four brands we have up here, what have you guys been up to and um, what are you hoping to showcase here at Rouleur? Well, we're actually celebrating our 125th anniversary as of today. Um, and obviously that's showcasing, taken from what was um, a family business all those, all those years ago who were innovators into the current tech and ourselves being innovators who like to push boundaries and, and uh, kind of never put limits on anything. 125 years in the bike industry. I think that deserves a round of applause. Congratulations. An incredible anniversary you're celebrating here with us. Uh, Rene, for you, 3T, what are you guys up to? Well, we're launching here our new all uh, new uh, road bike, the Strada, that's in the, the most affordable aero road bike in the market, so that's our second generation. And the second thing we're showcasing here is our made in Italy frames, because we're actually producing now bikes in Italy in our own factory. Yeah, we'll come on to that, obviously, because manufacturing, delivery, lead times, I'm sure many of you out there will have um, been waiting a while for bike parts, but obviously manufacturing in Italy must have its real benefits. Uh, Stefan, coming to you, BMC, you've got some pretty exciting stuff going on, haven't you? I mean, besides the uh, road machine and team machine, which are our most popular bike, we have here at the show the Caius, our new gravel race bike that was just introduced uh, two months ago. And I think as a very special thing is uh, the Team Machine SLR Masterpiece, which is definitely a bike which I invite everyone to, to touch, actually, because I think when you touch the bike, you see what is special about it. Great stuff. Get out there and touch that bike. Uh, Claudio, for you, what are you, what are Bianca bringing? Well, actually, we come here with the latest uh, generation of the Aero Ultra family. Uh, we, we came up with a very, very new Ultra RC, Super Aero Bike, the Hyper Bike from Bianchi, uh, introducing the, became quite famous now, <laughs> uh, Aero Deflectors. So we also invited to come to our booth to see, see the bikes. Thank you. Yeah, there's some incredible bikes out there, and certainly the four up here on stage are, are showcasing some of the very best as well. And in terms of the bike industry, how do each of you view it at the moment? It's gone through this incredible boom period during COVID when everyone realized that, oh, riding bikes is actually good fun and we have the time and the, and the space to do it. But that led to, I know, a lot of difficulties within the, within the industry in terms of lead times, in terms of getting the product to people, in terms of getting people out on the road. So how is the bike industry for each of you guys? It's, it's in a better place now. Last year <clears throat> and the year before, Obviously, we had some difficulties, as everyone knows, with um, supply chain issues more than anything else. At Ribble, we're, we're actually kind of lucky compared to some other brands because all of our bikes are hand-assembled in the UK and every bike is custom-made to order. So we have that, rather than having calendar years and model years where other brands might have a model of bike with a fixed spec that can't be changed from the moment that the publicity is, is sent out and the specs are confirmed, 
we've got that ability to chop and change and obviously being direct to consumer as well, a customer that potentially wanted to order a certain bike and it might have been something as simple as a saddle that was out of stock, um, six month lead time, we can literally phone call, email to that customer and say, look, six month wait, but we've got a whole choice of other saddles and you can have your bike next week. So obviously it definitely played into our hands having that on our side. Yeah, the benefits of actually producing here in Europe, indeed, rather than perhaps Asia, uh, is key, isn't it? Rene, what about you? What have you guys been recognizing within the industry? Well, there's been a real roller coaster in the last couple of years. Our headquarters is based in Bergamo, where the whole COVID pandemic started. We had a three month full lockdown after the reopening of the market took off. And um, we are focused on the performance gravel market, which is the market which is uh, doing very well. And um, yeah, since, since the reopening, we have been just trying to supply. And, uh, and MSA is now getting much better. Last year was still very tough. But now the supply is getting better and, uh, and we are happy that we are getting a lot more people on a gravel bike. I'm sure many will be happy to hear that out there. Um, and Stefan, for you, um, how are you, how are BMC coping within the bike industry at the moment? I think we were quite happy how we went through, through this period. Uh, of course, we, like everyone, I think we were suffering from supply, but we could always uh, supply at least some bikes. And uh, as as we already discussed, I think now is the moment where uh, availability is getting much better. And uh, yeah, I think overall super happy that uh, we see more people on bikes. Yeah, absolutely. And we can see we're in a bigger venue here and we're sold out tonight as well. So the popularity here at Rouleur as well is soaring. Claudia, for you, uh, Bianchi, how, how do you guys view the bike industry at the moment? Well, it is a very interesting um, period for the, for the entire industry, but I would say particularly for Bianchi. Uh, just before the, the pandemic period, uh, we decided to embrace a, a global change as, as a company, um, investing in a, in a new collection of e-bikes. We actually have been the first bike company registering uh, a trademark specifically for e-bike, the Bianchi Life e-brand because we were believing already in the uh, innovation, sustainability and, and well-being topics that will be really fundamental for, for the future. And at the same time, we, we start our big investment in creating a new facility in Italy. Uh, we talk about a 40 million euros investment in Italy with a, more than 30,000 square meters. Uh, it's a completely reassuring project and we want to bring back uh, the production and the real made in Italy uh, in, in the Bergamo area, very close to Milan, where Bianchi was founded almost 140 years ago. So uh, it's a challenging period, but a very motivating. Every day we go to the office with high motivation, and this is what is leading us. So great times. Well, let's talk about trends. You've mentioned e-bikes there, gravel. I'm sure some of you out there will have tried gravel, dipped your toe in, maybe absolute converts now to the gravel market. There's some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, are we, Bianca have gone big on e-bikes, right? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, we, we are quite well known for our road bikes. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our DNA. Uh, but we, it's part of our mission to be able to find new solutions to help people move. And, and the bikes, of course, is important for performance, for racing, but there's millions of people that they can find in the bike a new means of transportation. I mean, I just arrived here in London from, from Milan, and I saw a lot of people riding the bikes, and there's a, there's a big potential. I'm not talking just about business. Business will come. Uh, I mean, really helping changing the, uh, the behavior of the people, uh, contributing to create a greener world and uh, we believe e-bikes but not only can play a big role in this transformation. Yeah for sure. Anyone out there on e-bikes or gravel bikes enjoying those trends within the industry? Yeah fair few nods. Um, for you what trends are you noting uh, and what trends are you predicting as well for the future Stefan? I mean it's it's obvious gravel is uh, is definitely here to stay and I think uh, we are all enjoying the freedom we get uh, through that. Uh, I think definitely one thing we are after with BMC is we are actually now starting with getting serious about e-road where we have a new generation of bikes that uh, 
really look like road bikes, so it's hard to see that it's an e-bike. And they are also getting much, much lighter. And I think this will, uh, will find this uh, customership. And uh, yeah, let's see how this trend evolves further. I think it's already here. And uh, we hope from BMC side that we can be part of the brands that push e-bikes also on the performance bike side, not just for uh, commuting or yeah, this application where it's already very well established. And Rene, for you, uh, we'll talk about the gravel world. Is it here to stay? It's obviously had a big boom moment, hasn't it? Um, but, uh, you know, what can we expect from the future of gravel? Well, gravel is actually the wrong word because it's more all roads. I mean, you see definitely trends from people going from pure race bikes to more comfortable riding gravel all road bikes. That trend will continue. Uh, people want to go for performance with a bit more comfort. And I think the e-element of that will definitely help to, to boost the, the growth further. Because adding a motor to, to a gravel all-road bike opens up the sport for a lot more people. And I see more and more groups of people riding where half the people are riding on a regular bike and the other half on, a, on an e-bike. So now they can ride together where in the past they couldn't ride together. So there's a lot more people that can enjoy the sport together with different fitness levels. And that is also very important for the growth of the sector. Yeah, it's allowing more and more people to ride and, and access the sport that we all love. Um, Jamie, I'm going to come to you and we'll talk about aerodynamics. We've obviously seen huge gains in aerodynamics, but Ribble have got something quite special in terms of this, that you've actually been at the forefront, the center of not just developing it, but testing it. I mean, it's been a passion project for you, hasn't it? Uh, very much so. With our Ultra SLR that we launched uh, last year, um, a project that, as you say, um, complete involvement in from the very beginning. Um, when you're looking at that kind of project where aerodynamics is key, you know, we set out to design the most aerodynamic bike in the world. And that starts off with from the drawing board, CFD, wind tunnel testing, etc. Initial project was myself 3D scanned to then be put on um, onto a, a effectively a digital bike to perform CFD to get our initial um, initial feedback and we could play around with different um, different examples, different tube shapes, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, before moving into the wind tunnel. And it's the fastest bike in the world, that's how it's being built, isn't it? We, we, we like to think so, yes. I mean, we, we spent a lot, of, a lot of time, obviously, <laughs> some people might <laughs> I'm sure these three may disagree. <laughs> um, uh, one of the key features to, to the bike was the, the ultra handlebar, yes. which is, um, it actually, as you would with any bike, a lot of time is spent on the, the frame and the fork, but um, obviously the key to aerodynamics and a lot of data that often is, is missed, in, especially in marketing, um, is the fact that you have to be testing rider and bike as one. Um, you know, a rider makes around 80% of the total drag of, of, uh, of what you're actually um, moving, moving along the bike. Um, and during these tests, you know, we, we, we made a bike that, that was fast, but we got to what we thought was close to the end of the project and taking a, a traditional aerofoil, a very slim-lined handlebar. And this, although on its own is a very aerodynamic object, it creates clean air, which effectively then hits the rider, because it's the first thing that, uh, the, first thing that the, the, the air obviously hits. Um, so we kind of asked ourselves the question, what can we do about that? So we started playing around with shapes of the handlebar and effectively creating a handlebar with uh, wake generators, which effectively um, divert the airflow around the rider and obviously the key testing using myself initially and then we use multiple different um, size and shape um, athletes men and women to make sure that the theory we had worked across all your angles and uh, the different um, subjects incredible what a project to be part of and, and to see right through from the from beginning to end as well um, Claudio, coming to you, I know Bianca also obviously have the new Ultra and a radical air deflector within that which channels the airflow around the bike. Tell us some more. Well, the, the, the main point about the, the, the new Ultra is, I think, is the starting point of the, the design thinking that we had in Bianca. Um, I mean, we have a great engineers here. I'm, I'm in marketing, so I'm not a technical guy, but uh, what I, I've learned is that, for sure, uh, we can invest a lot into making a bike a super aero, but then you have to put an athlete on it. And then it's a disaster, right? <laughs> because at the end, we have different bodies, different shapes, you have legs moving. So uh, 
the starting point of the whole project was how can we uh, look at the overall performance of the of the athlete together with the bike. That that was the point. So of course we wanted to have uh, arrow shapes, but how can we try to reduce the drag, the arrow resistance of the athlete on the bike, considering then that, for example, differently from motor motorbikes, athletes they move legs and they create different vortices. So they they say that the impact of the of the body is around 80 percent of, of the of the arrow impact. So that was the 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 point, and we have created a different system that includes the air deflector, but not only, then the special shapes of the handlebar and some special inserts and the wheels that we have designed for the first time, our own wheels. So it's all together and it gave us incredible results. Yeah, stunning stuff. And like they said, uh, these bikes are out there to have a look at as well. Uh, Stefan, coming to you, BMC have been looking at a one-piece frame. So typically frames would come in about nine pieces, right? And you guys were looking to really minimize that effect and, and create this incredible sleek, light, one-piece frame. Yeah, it has always been a, a strive uh, for us to push the manufacturing. I mean, maybe some people remind that we had an uh, impact uh, road bike produced in Switzerland. So bike manufacturing has always been very important to us. And I think what is very special about the Masterpiece series of bikes is that we really can produce a frame in one shot without any uh, let's say, labor or finishing work after. So that's also why I like to invite you to, to touch the product because you will touch the raw carbon fiber. And I think through that, of course, today it comes at a very steep price tag because it's manufactured in Europe. We can do it. I mean, it's a lot of handwork and really only the best workers can do. But for me, it's very important that we have proven that it's possible and I think uh, this technology through the next years will also uh, find its way into the mass production. So it's kind of a sign pole uh, that we we wanted to put and yeah, you can buy it, uh, but it's still a very exclusive method, but I think it's important for the industry to also push the boundary uh, of manufacturing. Yeah, amazing stuff. Some real genius minds up here with me. Um, finally, from each of you, just one prediction, please, for the future of bike technology. Where do you see this going? Jamie, coming to you first. <laughs> Sorry, put you on the spot there. <laughs> um, I think, personally, uh, materials, as, as, if we're going to advance in materials, there's not been many material advances in bike development technology for quite a few years. Now we're starting to see... Um, Additive elements obviously appear in um, more specialist, specialist bikes, not really mass production, but obviously that has shown that that's definitely a direction that we can, we can take and we can look, look to in the future and hopefully turn it into a more mass, mass market, mass production methodology. Great stuff. Rene, for you, one prediction for the future? Well, one is uh, production in-house. Uh, that's where we uh, started six years ago and we will continue that. But other than that, I think that uh, bringing a battery to the bike will offer a lot of electronic options that we don't know yet, but things like rear view cameras and other sensors will come to the bike and will uh, improve and enhance the cycling experience. Awesome. Stefan, for you, one prediction for the future. I think we will see uh, more digital interaction with our bikes and hopefully they go in a direction where, where they are not just for entertainment but also help us to simplify and improve our ride experience. Finally, Claudia. Well, and also I would say uh, human-machine interaction. Look at the cockpits of the cars. Uh, I think on, in, for the bikes industry, we, we still have to work a lot on that and also work on the different variables on, of, the, of, the, of the bike for different uses. Brilliant stuff. Thank you all so much. Do get out there and have a, have a look, have a touch, have a feel of some of the incredible bikes that the guy, these guys have talked about. Um, just to let you know, of course, Ruler Live is put on by Ruler Magazine. They are offering a, um, 
a subscription discount to all of you as well. Less than half price, £20 for four magazines. So if you find one of the QR codes that's posted around the venue, um, you can subscribe to the world's finest cycling magazine. Do not leave the venue without them. Coming up next, we have legends of the cobbled classics, Tom Boonen and Fabian Cancellara in conversation with Matt Stevens. But for now, a big thank you to Claudio, to Stefan, to Rene and to Jamie.